All right. Yeah, and we'll go over the test again later tonight. Make a grade calculator program. All right, so <clears throat> purpose and have the user there enter their current average. Provide how much of the coursework is already graded. Then show what they need to average on the remaining work to get various letter grades. All right, so sample inputs. Say so they're getting an 85% or 95% since that's small. I figured decided to type against 50% of course being completed. All right, so the output would be something along the A. Keep an A, they need 85%. Their remaining coursework falling down to a B. Let's see, doing the math. Do you have to do, no, you can void is just being explicit for something that's implicitly there. Void means the absence of anything. Once we start getting into the things that we can have functions return, we'll talk more about void and then void star, which is an entirely different beast. All right, so, so my brain can do the math here. So we already have, uh, bust out my calculator. Try to bust out the calculator. If we can type correctly. 0.95 times 50, let's get out of programmer. All right, so we have 47 needed points. I need 32 of the 50, so I need like 65%, et cetera. All right, so like most applications, they have their purpose. They're going to need data from somewhere and then process that data. All right, so kind of like any other manufacturing machine or process. If you've got your algorithm to bake a cake, but until you actually provide the ingredients, the algorithm is not going to do anything at all just yet. Okay. We haven't talked about this very much. But variable names, right? I briefly mentioned single character variable names are something we'll tend not to see. But I think I mentioned count being a very bad name because the count of what? So the more explicit the name that your variable has, the better it is for someone to be able to read your program and understand what's going on. If I call everything float A and float B and then start doing some math, A equals B, all right, times 50 divided by 100, so just doing, start doing some weird math, trying to figure out what, what the purpose of this code is, becomes very, very difficult. Right, on a similar thread, adding comments to describe why this code was created, it's a good habit to get into because code's not always obvious as to why it exists. So it is helpful to include useful information. All right, so prompt user, get the data.
get the data, get the data. Always make sure you prompt the user a blank screen. Cursor blinking is not helpful. And all right, so now we get to do some math and start displaying things and we'll make some decisions on the results of the math because if they've got 25% grade and 90% of the coursework completed, then there's really pretty much one option at that point. So it all depends on what the data points are. And we just need to figure out the math. So the math is the right overall work completed is just basically multiplying those two together. So we just have to make sure that we're keeping things in the right scale. But multiplying them together. And we'll just see where we are so far so we can make sure we're paying attention to our math. And that's not called percent total. Overall points acquired. Yeah, let's leave that as a D then. And to run a program, say 95 and 80, and try to figure out what our bug is. Move my screens around a little bit here. Bring the code back up. We have a bug. How, how should we try to figure out where our bug is? Shall we start guessing or shall we jump into the machine? Okay, let's use some F10 and look and make sure we have what we have, where we think we have it. Because there's all kinds of places where this could be wrong. Our scanf may not have been working. All right, that scan is working. We've got 95. See, we're halfway through the course. Check code here, and that's got 50, so that's halfway through the course. Overall work completed. All right, this number is wrong, 4,750. We do need to do a divide by 100 to get that to say that we have basically 47.5 of our overall points in the course. And yes, that is exactly the problem. The percent D, this placeholder is not lining up with the data type of this variable. So when it tries to go into memory and pull out the bits, it's not pulling out the bits in the appropriate way so that it can transform it into text. It's trying to treat this float as integer and the data in this float is being treated as zero. All right, so that was our problem there and the problem could have been up here, right? It may have not had the ampersands or had the wrong placeholders up here. There are lots of places that the code might fall down. So it's best to step through and make sure you have all the pieces in alignment before digging in too deep. All right, so we'll divide by 100. Get that to the right scale. All right, so points needed for A is equal to 90, less their overall work completed, and that 90 and C. Uh, 100, 
Get my brain to work, my eyes the course were completed. I'm putting an F there just so it's automatically treating this literal as a floating data point, data point, data type, match the data types of all our variables. I could have did, just done 100, which is an integer literal, and it would have gone ahead and seen that little tooltip that says int, and it would have promoted that int to match the data type of the operand on the left-hand side of the division. And here we just save, save the step and have it be a float. All right. If I have point zero, then yes. Right, you see a mouse over that it pops up saying it's a double, which means it would push all these the entire thing up to a double and then give us a warning saying that this expression is a double and we're pushing it a larger container into a smaller container. All right. Now let's see if I can get my brain working to do what I just did five minutes ago in the calculator. All right. So if half the work is completed, they have 50 points remaining and see so we need to add this and they got 47 so that means no 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 that's for my 90. oh it's fun fun trying to do math on the fly okay 90 minus that divided by that. That should be good. So here's where we're going to do some comments to help. 90 total points is our A minus our example scenario 47.5 completed gives us 32.5 points needed out of 50 points that can be earned all right i believe i got my math right here so let's def oh let's first see if if we're an a get that second brain doesn't want to work tonight Percent needed to get an A. New line and points needed. Ninety five, fifty, and eighty five percent. All right, so my math is working at the moment. Perhaps the formatting of my output may not be the greatest. Point zero point eight five is eighty five percent. So, so we're going to reverse the math and add hundred back in there, and that's where formatting would be useful. For our output here and so I'll add a little formatting uh break my code oh I needed an extra percent sign here because I want to print out my percent sign all right so we need 85 percent and only want two decimal places to the right which is this 0.2f needed to get an a All right, and then we can repeat this code a bit to go ahead and do the calculations for B and all the other fun stuff. There are some negative scenarios. Current average is zero and we're halfway through the coursework. All right, and you need 180% to get an A, right? So we can test on that 
give out a different message saying that NA is out of reach at this point in time, having not done any of the work halfway through the course. But on that thread, always turn in your late work. It's always worth something up to the point, last point in which I accept late work. And we'll be talking about that more again later tonight. We'll get to our labs and programming assignments. That's how we would build this program. Is that All right? So I wanted to print out an ampersand. So let me show that on the screen again. 80, 75% of the way through the course. Yeah, it looks like I have a math bug here because uh, my math is definitely wrong there, but I wanted to output this percent onto the screen. And so I just put a percent in there the first time and I broke the code because that's like, that's a placeholder. And the character after it was not a valid placeholder and or I didn't give it a variable to match things up. So if I want to print out a percent sign, I need a percent sign in front of the percent sign so that it just treats the next percent sign as a literal percent sign. All right. The percent five is saying to make sure I put five characters on the output. And you see, I have it one, two, three, four, five. If I make it larger, right, that's the one where I give you a link. If I make it up to seven, Right now it's got extra white space. Now there are seven characters forced out on the output. All right, so if they need like 6%, is there at 95, 100% of 95% or whatever, something like that, there would be just a blank space character at the end there. But uh, clearly there's a math bug. And this is why we need multiple test cases to make sure that things are lining up. All right, find that. All right. Okay. Other questions at the moment? That file is uploaded. Feel free to take that as an exercise to plumb it out. Yeah, the if statement was to make sure that they could actually get an A. So it, I was going to, next step was to add a test that that was less than 100 to make sure that it's less than or equal to 100 to make sure that the grade's actually in range or not. And otherwise we'll print on message saying that that's not possible. All right. <clears throat> Let's see. Let's start doing some more work with arrays. And percent five, the five part, the percent was required because that lines up with the F, the, the five being left to decimal. No, that's not required. You could, I could have just said point two to force two decimal places.
Okay, four loops. Four loops and arrays tend to often go hand in hand. Arrays are a complex type. That's our, our simplest complex type we can have. The idea of an array is to hold on to multiple values. So, example, let me draw, let's see. And so this array numbers is going to allow me to store onto three integer values. So it's going to create space in memory for three integers. Int. All right, much like if I were to say int A, B, C, this creates three integers in memory somewhere, each of which have their own memory address. In fact, let me do that separately. Let's try to copy this. Nope, all right. All right, so I've got a box for A, a box for B, and a box for C in memory somewhere. Since they're all declared together, they're probably all right next to each other. But they're separate and independent integer variables. With my array numbers, they're all bound together, allocated in memory, all one after the other in memory. And the way that we get to each of these locations in memory is with the indexing operator, where this square brackets and an integral value inside the square brackets or integral expression is how we get to each of those elements. So when I loop, it's i starting at zero, i less than three. The first time through, I set the value in this box equal to zero. So I made that one a zero. And I came along and made that one a one. And this one a two. After my numbers were all set, then I went ahead and looped again, across the numbers, and then index into those out positions in the array and spat them out. All right, which is a much easier way than trying to right, say a equals two, e equals four, and then C equals six, and then try to print out all my values, right? So I print F. The number is percent D, and then A, and then good old copy paste to print out B and C. All right, this is only a three element array, so that's not too, still kind of same number of lines of code, three lines of code, yeah, really two lines of code because curly braces don't really much count as a line of code, but as soon as this array grows to 5, 15, 500 elements, <laughs> this code does not scale well at all. So the idea of arrays is to help manage a collection of items. And when we're doing this, they're all going to be the same data type. So every element in this array is going to be an int. Since they're all the same data type, each size of each box here is all the same. And the way that the indexing operator works is it's just doing a mathematical computation based off of the memory address stored here in numbers, and then offsetting to get to those particular locations. All right, so let's go ahead and show where things are floating around in memory. All right, so the address of A, A, B, and C. Hmm. 
Yeah, I lost my double quotes. Place to here, right? So before I get to printing out the array, I'm going to go ahead and print out where just our local variables A, B, and C are. Using percent C, percent C, percent P as our placeholder and the ampersand to give us the memory address. All right, so like we mentioned before, a variable is just a named location of memory. Every location of memory has a memory address. The computer system is effectively more or less using the memory address to figure out where to go to, into memory to go ahead and read or write to that location in memory. Update the bits or get the bits and then put them into a register or another variable or whatever is going on there internally in the CPU. So percent P pointer is doing a hexadecimal memory address. Right, if I were to print this out as just percent D, I'd be getting the same effective thing, but just in base 10. And that's not working out so well. Um, let's see. Let's read that long decimal. Let's see if that works. Still not working. All right. Fine. I will use my calculator. So we can see, uh, I don't really need the whole thing, I'll just get this part. Go back into our programmer mode. Go next decimal, paste the value. And we can see the decimal value of these. And you can see that memory locations here are quite specifically offset what do we got there six to eight so we got 32 across in between these memory addresses right so i'm just trying to think one of us showing me the memory address as a bits or bytes but the memory is going to be spread apart Depending on where things are declared and what's declared, where they're, where they're all declared, there's going to be a little bit of a semblance of order, but it's not as rigid as it's going to be for when we do the same thing with our array. All right, so first we'll do the array itself. See where numbers is element percent d is and then here we'll do our numbers sub i and ampersand so show you the output and then do 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 uh, forget, I kind of forget. An argument there, let's try that again. All right, much better. All right, so zero, one, and two are each integers. They're each stored at their own location in memory. You can see these are much closer together than my local variables were. I I'd have to do some digging around to find out why it's putting so much space between these. And here, things are much, much closer together, right? Four apart, which I was expecting, four being four bytes, because they are 32-bit integers. So every four bytes, we have 
an element in our array. So if my array were bigger, uh, yes, this is base 16. All right, so 9A, B, C, that's, that's four away. And then you've got D, E, F, and then zero, bringing us to the next one here. So if I were to make this, make this a little bit bigger of an array, I know my threes, replace them all with fives. Talk about a way to make that easier to change in a moment here. All right, so here it's easy to see they're off by four when we've got not rolling over into the ABC land. Yeah, so I was trying to get my pointer to show in base 10, but one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. All right, it's showing me eight bytes since because I'm on a 64 bit system. It, it, oh, yeah, yeah, x64. Let's change this to x86. Let's see if I can get things that work the way I want them to work. All right, x86. I think I can keep these in. Yeah. Let's see. That's better. Now I'm not getting weird negative numbers. Now they want to x86, which means a 32 bit. Right, you know, you see that Windows program x86 folder program files and then just program files or program files being the 64-bit applications and x86 being the 32-bit applications. All right, so here it's easy to see going up by four by four going to 12. Every four bytes is the next element in the array. The very first element in the array is at the same memory address that is stored in our array variables at all. So the value that numbers holds, numbers being an array, and arrays being reference types, it stores a memory address. At that memory address is the first element of our array. That's why our arrays are zero based. So when, when I come along and I say numbers sub i, when i is zero, that just means that memory address that is numbers. So arrays are continuously allocated or continuously allocated or completely in a line. There's no gaps in the array. It's one complete allocation of memory wherever it is being allocated in memory. So a lot of the time, when we're going to be working with an array, then we're very much likely going to be working with a for loop to go along with that. Now, let's talk about this hard code literal five. What type of application will arrays be used for? Not most applications, because usually we have collections of data, right? So uh, this list of files here is probably being stored in an array. List of tabs being stored in array, the list of students are in array. Generally, whenever you're going to have a collection of more than one of the same thing, it's going to be stored in an array or an array based container. That's not always the case. At the very end of the course, when we're talking about linked based structures, and we'll look at alternatives to arrays, but arrays are going to be very, very common for storing things. Right, like for all the pixels on the screen, for example, that's being stored in a two-dimensional array or possibly a three-dimensional array, depending on how they're doing their buffering mechanics. But arrays are going to be quite commonly used, and we will be using them a lot for C strings, because C strings are character arrays. And then also our programming assignments, program two and beyond, 
I think two and beyond. We'll be using arrays to represent the people in our payroll application that we will be developing. Uh, okay. All right, if I want to resize this array and I just make it like say 10, right, and rerun my program, right, nothing changed. I made my array bigger, but I didn't change all my associated code that is working with the array. So you know, that's not an ideal way to do things. And we'll be getting to even better ways of doing this later. And we'll be talking more about defined statements again later. Get further depth of this. This is a macro. Macros is a later topic, but for the sake of making things better, instead of me hard coding the number five everywhere that I want to work with this particular array, I'm going to use this pound define, which is a preprocessor directive, and basically it says it's doing a find replace. The preprocessor is coming along and taking the expression that's after the name of the macro and just dropping five back in there. So if I want to change five to 10, now everything's, now we're going to see everything 10 times. I would just say, oh, that was too many things. Oops. I want to go back to my first version where there was just three because it's a lot easier to test my data for three elements than it is for 30 or five or whatever the number ultimately is going to be. I only need to change this one bit of the code. It's still hard coded value, but at least it's only hard coded in one place. Okay, let's drop that up there. Let's calculate the average of a set of numbers. Okay. Uh, yeah, that works. Uh, the difference between that is it's not allowed. I say, like, if I say size equals 10 and then say int n size, so depending on your compiler, it's not going to be allowed because it's not a compile time constant. All right, so the error you're going to get here say is expression must have a constant value. All right, so I'll, I'll, okay, I'll try to change that. Say const, and it's be like expression must have a constant value. It still doesn't allow it. Different compilers will say fine, I'll allow it. They, uh, I'm not sure how they get around with doing it because when we get into functions, calling a function involves a memory allocation called a stack frame. So it, need, it needs to know how big to make that stack frame to dump all uh, the variables into their appropriate spot. And by doing something where the user is providing information with an actual variable, It doesn't actually know how big to make the stack frame, so you're, it'll actually basically be overflowing the stack frame. So this is why I'm doing a define, because this is a an actual constant value. It is literally going to be just three, whereas this is not generally supported, but it does some compilers will let you do this. 
we'll have to get to dynamic memory allocation to actually be able to dynamically make an array of whatever size that we have enough memory to make in the future. Uh, all right, shorthand operator. One that we talked about this last time, maybe one of the places that we would make use of it. Key thing to make sure that we're getting the right sum is initializing things properly. Uh, the question is, does define pound define remove the ability to scan if the value? Yeah, th this is not a variable. It's a macro. So this, by the time the code gets compiled, it no longer exists. It's a preprocessor directive. Anything that starts with a hashtag is a preprocessor directive. So that means even before we compile, the IDE is going to go in and do some massaging to the code and then compile. So if I were to put something over here that was garbage, it's going to be like, no, expands X and X is undefined. It does not know what X is. Or if I were to try to say like int x equals 10 sort of thing, you'd be like, no, x is not a constant value. All right, so it's, basically it's running the preprocessor commands right now to see what this really array size really means because it's doing background compilation. It's like, no, I can't put x there because that's what it's putting there. So it's literally just whatever is here gets replaced into wherever we're using the macro. And it does have a, a slightly, was that fuchsia? It's a purpley color to identify it as being a macro. All right, calculate the average of the numbers is probably be a good idea to print out the numbers so we know what it's actually doing when it's calculating things out here, but right, looping and arrays usually working side by side. Okay. Now yeah, let's switch over to some more some while looping. While looping tends to be a little bit less determinant. All right, so here we're also going to calculate the average. Of numbers entered by the user. So we'll get our sum. And I'm using a float so we don't do our Android math. And float user value. And then we'll do a while one or while user value. It's not equal to negative one. S user for a number, scan up that number. Scan the number and then drop into our variable. If that, well, I'll do the correction later. All right, so sum plus equals user value. And when we're all said and done, Spit out the average again. Two semicolons on 23. Oh yeah, extra semicolon. That would be that would be a null statement. So the compiler doesn't care about it. Is it just an empty statement? So it's like whatever. It's just it's almost the same thing as a blank line, but thank you. The average is sum divided by some number. All right, so the average is 
the total divided by the number of numbers. So we will need to keep track of a count. So we'll do a plus plus there. And then replace this with count. All right, so I have some issues with this, which we'll fix in a moment. But let's go ahead and test it out first. Oh, bugs, what are we? Scan it, that's my warning. Where's my error? Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Still use the same project, so it should be a uh... uh... oh, because I switched to okay, that's why. Let me go back to six x sixty four. Because that's a different set of settings. All right. So negative one to stop. Let's make sure that we can actually stop. And our average is negative one. So uh, that kind of makes sense. We only entered one value. It was negative one. Then we get into the scenario. All right, five, eight, nine, minus one. Right, our average when I did 589 last time was 7.33. Right, so minus one is being counted in our average. It's probably not what our program wants to do. So, how would we not count minus one? Any ideas? At what point in our code, an if statement, all right? All right, an if statement to account for it, yep. Sounds good, so there's two ways. We can do this one, we can just stop the value from getting there in the first place, or we can do an offset sort of thing, right? So the user typed negative one, so Reducing the count by one gets us back to the correct count, and then adding one to offset that negative one gets us back to the correct count. So here's the way I would not recommend just offsetting it back to get us back to what else we should be. And of course, I didn't use eight, nine, use seven, eight, so 6.667. But yes, an if statement would be a better way just not to do the work. not equal to negative one. Then we can go ahead and include it in our sum. And it's 589 gives us the average that we're now expecting. Seven and a third. Right, this could also be a do while. So go ahead and grab that while off the front, toss it on the end, add a semicolon, and then put a do in the front. And a do makes more sense here because we're always wanting to at least ask for one number. Since we're always wanting to ask for at least one number, whether you, whether it's negative one or not, the average is not a number, didn't blow up. <laughs> In older versions of C, this would give you a lovely blue screen of death, dividing by zero. Fun bugs, fun bugs. I, I'm trying to remember how many years ago it was. I used to be able to just go ahead and write, you know, the program and do divide by zero and bam, blue screen of death. I would crash the, the school computer. The systems have gotten a little bit smarter now. I, I'm not too sure if it is Windows itself that is 
properly handling this or if it's actually the code that is being injected around our stuff by the compiler and the standard libraries. I think this is going to be the operating system that's doing it. But uh, this used to be the good old infamous blue screen of death. Maybe you can remember that because we did a divide by zero. And that is something we should also watch out for. Count is zero. All right. Should protect against it. Because on some systems, that might still be the blue screen of death. So the do while looping version has that protection in there. Yes, haven't seen it. Well, fortunately, the good thing about this, every time you run it, it does save. And yeah, I, I, I have done that before. I was doing Visual Basic a long time ago. It was Visual Basic was it interpreted so it didn't actually need to save and compile and all that fun stuff and i i, I did some, whatever i did i caused visual studio to crash and there goes all the code huh. all right uploading do while yeah so while and do while are often found in use when we're not dealing with arrays because arrays we typically go through the entirety of the array when we're processing the data whereas a do while usually we're we're looking at information that is ascertained in the body of the loop somewhere to decide if we want to keep on going right and another way that we could have dealt with this extra input is by breaking out of the loop early. All right, so that the while condition here is a bit superfluous. We will never actually get there, but we can leave it in there for explicit purposes so if the user value is negative one we will just flat out stop looping All right so the average of five will just be five and it is done the logic that we want it to do okay now let me let me slow down Ignoring line 17 because that's just a tidbit we'll get into later. What of any of these lines of code, except for the return, because that's still functions we'll get to later. What in here uh, do you want greater details and explanation on? Any questions, any migraines? Line 34, 35, so line 34. All right, so our sum, which we start off at zero. First time through. Zero is gonna be read from sum and whatever the value user typed, in case our case was five, so let me step through. And right, so I type five. And so sum is presently zero. User value that scan have provided to us was five. So we're going to take zero plus five, add those two together, and then push the result of that back into sum. All right, so that gives us our total running count at or our total running sum so far at five. And our count will go from our initial value of zero to one to indicate how many numbers we have collected from the user. So as they keep giving us additional data points, all right, so my sum is five from our previous edition. We'll add eight to that five and then push the result back into sum. So now we've got 13 in our running total 
and increase our count from one to two to track that we've gotten two numbers from the user. So right now our average is 6.5. So if we were printing out, right, the current average is percent F of percent D numbers entered. All right, we could do the same calculation we're doing here. Sum and count. All right, go to nine. Do the math as we'd done it before. And keep on calculating as we go. Question is, so for all float variables, does the decimal number have to be an F? No, if we're using double instead of float, then we could just do double. All right, so I'll make this version three. And we can place, let's try that again, but with double. And I'm not fully sure what the details are with 2022 of Visual Studio. That's letting percent F work with doubles, but I am going to put LFs in here to be consistent with how things were before. So I'll run that again, then I'll get to next questions. All right, so still same as or effectively, but now we're just using a double. So we're using more memory than we would be using. And if we were using a float, most likely. But our numbers aren't really large enough to warrant using that much larger of a data type. But it gives us more or less the same place. Let me make sure I upload that before I forget. Uh, that stop. So I already forgot to upload version two, but this is a superset, so we're good. All right, let's see. Questions, several questions. Let me all get through all those. Just to double check, do while well, always, yeah, so that's like, that's what differentiates do while from while or for loops. Do while guaranteed to execute or enter the body at least once. There might be a break or a continue or something like that. So we don't necessarily execute every statement of code in the body of the do while, but we're guaranteed to enter the body. A for loop and a while loop will do a test first before getting into the body of the loop. And that test may return zero, in which case we will not enter the body of the loop. Uh, the difference between puts and printf is printf lets us print our variables, whereas puts just puts, it's good for putting out a, a, a string message. And it also does the new line for you, which I find useful because I like to forget to do backslash, backslash n myself quite often. Uh, if statements don't need curly braces, if they only have one line of code, work on and the same thing is true for fours right i could can eliminate no, let's make that a zero make it empty All right so this statement of code belongs to the for loop it is an empty statement and this loop's never going to be entered anyway so that empty statement is good enough because i will start off at zero Zero is not less than zero, so it will never go into the body of the code. It won't execute here, and I will not be incremented. And the same thing for while. All right, the block of code or the line of code, aka statement of code that follows the header, is what belongs to it. So curly braces are a good habit to get into using, but I tend to not use them all the time. Uh, 
uh, one of the companies I worked for, if I recall correctly, their, their coding standards required always using brackets or the curly braces. And it is a good habit to get into because right, you might want to add more code later and it's a little bit easier to see the association. I find it just ends up being a lot of white space. So I often do it like this, but adding the curly braces after the fact is a little bit annoying. Especially with Visual Studio and doing it on a blank line and it doing it right, doing the closing one right there, which means this else branch is now empty. And this printf is just a free, a free, a free floating value that is uh, not associated with that else statement. Right, so some things do require, I'm trying to remember, I don't recall if the do while. I, let me see. Yeah, see this one, the do while, this one, not happy that I don't have curly braces because now it's basically a do floating around by itself. And here I, I do have a while statement. So basically this while is trying to be in the body of this do, so. I gotta have my curly braces on the do while. But most uh, constructs that are within a function don't need the curly braces. But you're always safe to put them there. So it, you can go ahead and put it there. In fact, I have one of my coworkers, he's got code that kind of irritates me with doing things like this. Where you just got these extra curly braces, which you're perfectly allowed to do. It's just a nested, it's a subscope. It creates a subscope, which we'll get into later. And it's just, it doesn't belong to a header. And you're totally free to do that. I wouldn't do that because I can't think of a good reason why you'd want to do that. I can come up with a reason why I do it. It's just not a good reason. Uh, Let's see. Yeah, bracket brackets is a good pattern to use to. And one of the things that I want to point out, uh, if you're if Visual Studio, like when I hit the enter key, notice that the the alignment of the cursor right now is in alignment with my line of code of above. If I forget something, you see when I hit the enter key here. Now it's in alignment with the X. It's tabbing over because it's it recognizes that the line of code above isn't complete and it's still expecting something. So if it, it's tabbing over for you automatically, and you're oops, it did, I didn't want to do that. Right? Usually that means there's something weird going on. So the same thing if I do a four, right? And, and whatever. I don't need anything here. So I want to hit the enter key. See how it's the alignment of my cursor is tabbed over is because it's saying this line, right, longs to the forever loop, which is why it's tabbing it over. And of course, that's white space. It doesn't actually have to be. Okay, I need to change the thing I was using. My tabs are being turned into spaces, and I have no patience for that at all. All right. Uh, where's my tab? There we are. All languages, tabs, smart, keep tabs. All right. Now I probably have to load up a new visual see for the take effect. Okay. All right. It, the F, right, so because these are doubles, right, so when I mouse over this literal, a little tooltip that pops up says, this is a double. 0, 0.0 is a double. Since sum is a double, the right-hand side data type is identical to the left-hand side data type, which is what you generally want to have. So when I was doing this with float, going from a double literal into a float literal technically could cause an overflow. So you might see a warning in the output saying the potential loss of data by doing that. So the F says, no, just 
cast that literal as, or treat that literal as a floating point. All right, so here I can get rid of that now since we're in double space. Otherwise, the equality operator would actually have to promote a float because I can't compare a float to a double. I can't compare two variables of different data types. A conversion, if available, will need to be done first, and then it can do the comparison. OK, let's go ahead and take a five minute break. We've been going here for a good solid hour. We'll take five, we'll come back, and we'll continue along. It's a, uh, yeah, it's related to typecasting. There we go. All right. Let's see. OK, so. In 10 minutes, I just do math in my head. So 9.50, okay, so we've got about an hour left. Okay. While we're here, I'll just double check. I see some of you have already started program zero. That's good. Do we have any other questions on program zero at the moment? Yeah, is it, um, I know for the quotient, since you know when you divide, you're not always gonna get whole numbers. Is it all right if we just use integer for that, um, for like all of them, or do you yep. want us to? Okay. It's perfectly fine for this. Thank you. We have any other questions on program zero? Did you just want us to turn in the C file? Yeah, just the C file is fine. It, there's people been having issues trying to upload the executable, so I don't know, Canvas is like, ooh, bug, virus, bad, bad .exe file. <laughs> so is my suspicion there. So we just, it's not worth the effort of zipping in and then un, and then me unzipping in just so I can try to, do I, do I trust this file not to, to format my C drive anyways? Yeah, the .c file is, is good for all the program assignments. If I need to compile it to see, more than of what's wrong, and then I might see just by reading the code, then I, I'll just compile the code. Okay. I, I did fix the Technic Zoom to not have Monday as a class. So that's no longer showing up here on the syllabus. And that would be our 4th of July holiday, so we're no class or anything due on that Monday. But we do have our for loop and do while loop labs. Uh, do between now and the next time that we will be in class. So I, I will swing back over those later tonight after we go over the test. And assuming that we're still finding use in this bugs folder, my objectives on, on Thursday nights to come along here and keep adding bugs for you to uh, practice finding bugs. All right, any other questions about anything at the moment? Let's see. <clears throat> okay. Uh, I'm sorry. Okay, C strings. All right, so we saw this a little bit already. Last time a little bit. Yeah, so. Since Monday is a holiday, I won't bother doing any late penalties until Wednesday of next week. Just in case people are going to be out of town for the weekend, which is means you should bring your laptop with you and or your book and or whatever electronic device you can have with you so you can keep reading uh, materials because, you know, 
It's very easy to fall behind. All right, so character arrays. And I guess I have my great calculator comment still here, so remove that. An array is an array. That being collection of elements, all of which have the same, have the same data type. All right, so let me go ahead and give some values to this array. And let's say char letter, char letter equals little a and letters less than let's see what's the 10th letter of the alphabet m's 13. hey professor i think your screen is frozen i'm not seeing anything updating oh yes totally frozen <clears throat> thank you for for saying i i didn't notice six people see the same thing in the chat window all right Character arrays. <clears throat> right, whatever, so we can recognize a variable as being an array when it's declared by having square brackets after its name. So this means the name of our variable's first name. There are however many there are, whatever's the literal value inside the square brackets, so 10 in our case here, and each one is a char. All right, 10th letter, so JKL. J, what is that? J, close enough. Letter plus plus. Go ahead and initialize our first name equal to letter at that particular index. And I equals zero. Let's get that over here. All right, so first name sub i equals letter. And let me do this differently. Let me switch. We have i in my indexer. That's probably a better way to do that. i less than 10. I plus plus. All right, there's uh, first name sub i is equal to letter, and we'll do our plus plus over here. That seems a little bit more standard. Okay. But uh, oops. All right, so assuming I don't have any bugs, which is not always a good assumption, program's gonna go ahead and spit out the first 10 letters of the alphabet. So let's go over our code here. So line five creates our array variable called first name. It has room to hold 10 characters. Create a letter variable, char data type. It's simple variable type char and it holds on to a single character value. Standard four header looping from zero to 10, not inclusive of 10. And then we'll just drop in the little a up first. And then I'll increment my letter variable by one, which brings it to b and then so on and so forth, incrementing through the letters. So we've done that 10 times, and then we'll just put each char out onto the console. Now, that character array is not a C string. If I call puts on first name, and when I run this code, all right, I got my, loop, print out my first 10 letters, and then I told puts to put my string out, and it put out the first 10 letters, and then a whole bunch of fun, however far it actually went, decided to get dropped out onto the screen as well. 
a C string is null terminated. My character array, which I'm just using purely as an array, is not null terminated. All right, so the more commonated, com commonly used pattern for using character arrays is as a C string. And I'll first point out that it's first and foremost an array. A C string is a pattern that exists on top of character arrays. Right, in fact, let me rename this to say this is not C strings, this is character arrays. All right, and I'll drop that up. Google, now let's switch this, make it a C string. All right, so one of the nice things about Uh, let me just get rid of this part here. Uh, character raises, they do have opt initialization options, make things easier. So we saw this earlier with me initializing my injury array. If I want to do the same thing with Characters as characters, I have to do a whole bunch of fun single quotes. All right, so the arrays are still the arrays, but the way I'm initializing things, my output will be a little bit different here. And let me do a It's an empty line there, give me an empty line. All right, so the first time I was using put chart and I was printing out the characters that are in my array. So the array was actually being printed out here. In fact, let me change this to being empty line to be a period so we can see that. Oh, that's interesting is pushing out nulls and it didn't actually take any white space. Huh, that wasn't what I was expecting. Okay. <clears throat> so our initialization. Of Bob. Null characters, so it's being null terminated and it's being null terminated. Quite far down the line because I use an initializer here. When you use scanf, let's say I've changed things, you'll notice that it's a little bit lazier about doing the null termination. It's not going to null terminate everything like we did here. And Smith will be the same thing once we've gone through this initialization. And what happens is it's going to just basically do a copy. First value in the comma separated list, it gets dropped into index zero. Second value index one and so on and so forth. And it is also helping us out there and making sure the areas of the array that we have not specified a data point have nothing in it at all. And uh, putcher apparently handles nulls fairly well and didn't actually put any anything out onto the console at all. But here in our first loop, I'm still just treating the array as just an array. Curious what that green school is about, but I'll get to that later. So we're still looping on the elements in the array, but there's nothing, nulls, nothing to actually put onto the screen. So we just keep on looping, looping around. And puts is effectively doing the same thing as this for loop, plus, you know, actually detecting for the null character. And once it does find the null character, it stops. Sorry, calling puts just goes to the first character, drops it on the console, moves to the next character, drops the console. It's using pointers to actually do all that work. And long ago, I was, they let me actually step into this code and I can show you that fun stuff, but uh, 
Last name might not be zero terminated. Okay, so that's giving me some warnings in there. All right. Interesting. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so this is a C string with explicit storage. The other way we might be interacting with our C strings is with a char star. A char star is related. to a character array, but is not the same thing. It is very similar. In fact, let me put my breakpoint here. Because the values are going to be the same. They're both reference type. So we look at the values, C string, it's hexadecimal value ending with C98. And we look at the value first name, hexadecimal value also ending in C98, because when I did line 18, the value on the right-hand side of my assignment operator is my first name variable. My first name variable is a character array. Arrays are reference type variables, which means it stores a memory address. So this value 2E9A, blah, 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 blah. That value was read from this variable and then copied into my C string variable. And so it did not copy the array, it copied where in memory the array is, which is the base memory address where the first element is. So when I call puts C string, it's the same thing as calling puts first name because the exact same value is being given to puts. Yes, so the question is if I were to change, uh, and I'm gonna clarify your statement, if I were to change first name, C string would also change. If I were to change the elements in first name, then yes, C string will see the updated state because it is tracking that same location in memory. So yeah, if I go ahead and capitalize, is uh, all right, capitalize minus equals, because Bob's lowercase, right? Yeah, minus equals 32. And then we put, First name and puts the C string. All right, we get capital Bob out there twice. One from going directly to the array and the other going to the same array via a pointer. So we get capital Bob and capital Bob. Most of the time when we're working with pointers, we won't be working with them in this manner where we are sending a pointer to a value that is in uh, of a variable that's already in the same chunk of code we're in. When we move on to functions, very often we need the memory address for that function to properly do its job. Right, so in fact, puts, right, puts wants a char star. It wants a memory address to do its job. Yeah, so the value of first name, because it's a reference type variable, is a memory address. The value of, oh, if I recall, right, C string being a pointer is also a memory address. So we have two categories that all variables fall into. There are either going to be a value type variable or a reference type variable. Reference type variables, which are pretty much just arrays and pointers, are memory addresses as the value that they store. Value type variables store one, two, three, A, B, C type things as the values that they store. It's the actual variable state that is data that the system is going to make use of to some effect. All right, so the difference between a char star and a character array, a character array specifies storage for however many elements we say it can store. Whereas the char star specifies storage just for the pointer. So I can't 
And let me uh, let me upload this one before I go down and do rabbit hole activities here. All right, so char stars. All right, so I can't just come along and say char star C string and then try to say C string sub zero equals little a. All right, so I have two problems here. Uh, it might actually run at runtime, but not likely, good, not building, good. Initialize a variable. All right, well, let's see. OX, FF, A, let's get some, some value here. So it might be a legitimate address. Probably not. This is bringing me a, eh, probably a segmentation fault. We'll see in a second here. Let's see what it does. All right, right access violation. Basically a segmentation fault, as one, one in the class was liking to say earlier on. So I gave C string a memory address. Uh, memory address I gave it was probably not a valid memory address within the application domain of my running process. On line six, I went ahead and offset this memory address by zero to attempt to change the data at that location of memory. And it's like, no, you can't write to that location of memory. That's not an area of memory that you have access to. So I, one of the other things, in fact, let me give it a good memory address, and then I will actually change it. All right, so we'll go ahead and put char the letter, and then we'll put char the C string, see how well it likes that. Might be making it a little bit mad there because that's pointer. Eh, let me do puts. Eh, probably would be mad as well. All right, we'll do this one line at a time because we're in a, trying to break it land here. Okay, so right now, my pointer is good. X is the value that we're storing in the letter. And my C string is pointing to the location memory of where that X is. So we can see X right here at the beginning. The debugger is being a little bit funny because it's treating my char star as a C string because C strings are a special case scenario. So it's expecting it to actually be a string, not just a single character. So it's looking for null and just running around until it finds it. So put char. I don't know what was going on my windows here. Keeps on wanting to reuse the old one. All right. So put char puts our letter there and put char with a C string. Yeah, that was not working too well because it's of what we gave it. So let me fix that by doing the reverse of a pointer which is dereferencing our pointer and put out the letter. <clears throat> okay. All right, so I'm sure I'm, I'm frying some brains at the moment right now, but you, you have a nice long weekend to, to keep reading up on pointers. You wanna, I'm going to try to find several articles for you to read on pointers because pointers is a significant mental hurdle to absorb what's going on there. So in fact, let me get a drawing going. It's not what I meant to create. I meant to create a drawing. All right, so we have too many columns here. 
Do do do. Variable name and its value. So we have the variable letter. It has the value x. We have the variable c string. It has where, yeah, I guess, but let me do that. I can put the column over here. Oh, call right. Location. It's address. All right, so let me see if I can get the value here. Too many zeros, we'll get rid of a few of those. All right, all variables have a location memory and let's find out where C string is. All right, C string has a location memory after we execute Line six. And get some color in here. These two values are the same. Right, because this is what the ampersand is giving us. Line six is using the ampersand operator. That's the address of operator uh, questions. Are pointers exclusive to C? No. If C++ uses them, Really, everyone uses them. Java um, explicitly hides it from the application developer. C Sharp primarily hides it from the application developer, but you can use pointers if you want to. But a lot of higher level languages just abstract it away to it's just it's a reference type. And you don't need to worry about pointers because pointers really are evil because they have a tendency to be a problem in applications where pointers go awry. Like my C string here, my pointer is going awry here. It's it's going way off, way off course. All right, so like I mentioned before, variables simply represent a location in memory. At that location in memory, we expect to find a value. If the data type, I might as well go, yeah, let's go ahead and add a column for the data type. Data type. Letter is a char, C string is a char star. All right, so based off of the data type, that will drive what value we'll expect to see at that location in memory. All right, so internally there's a symbol table that's tracking this. So whenever we use our variable name letter in code, that really just means this memory address. Same thing, whenever we use our variable name C string in code, that, that more or less really means the memory address. And very often the case, we'll just be working with the value at that memory address. So when I said put char letter, that value X was read from the location memory known as, known by a letter. So came into RAM, found our value X, and then gave that to put char and it spat it out onto the screen up here at the console top of your screen. Line eight, I called put char and said C string. The value of C string is this memory address. And when I gave this memory address to put char, it just took that value, which is hexadecimal, which is basically integer nature, just like the letter was. The letter is 120. The value 120 was given to put char. Put char turned that into a little x. And then when I called put char again on line eight, some of this data in here, I'm not exactly sure which bit of this data in here was grabbed. And that numeric value was looked up against the ASCII symbol table and found out to be T. So it spat out a T because I gave it numeric data. I gave it way more data than it needed, but it does whatever it can. C likes to do whatever it can. All libraries do as much as they can. It's only when you go beyond protection layers and you get read or write access violations that says, oh, I'm going to, the operating system is saying, no, you, you've gone too far and we're going to go ahead and blow up. Line nine, which would be the correct usage to put the char out. 
I'm adding a star in front of C string. What that's going to do is dereference this memory address. So it's going to follow the line, go to where this is pointing. So basically, we have a pointer that is going to that location of memory. This says, go to X, read X, and then give X, aka 120, to put char, which it then turns into X on the console. All right, so now we'll go ahead and do the same chunk of code over here. C string, sub zero is an alternative way of doing star C string. They're both doing the same thing. Star is a dereference operation and our square brackets here, when we're using the variable, not declaring the variable, when we're using the variable, is also a dereference operation. So we're going to offset the memory address stored in this variable by zero. Now that we have that location in memory, which is here, all right, so we look at C string. C string says 554. So it's talking about this location of memory where X is. We're going to replace X with A. So X is now A. So when I print them out again, I get ATA on the output. A because the value at this location of memory has been changed. So I'll put a new table here with a new state. Do, 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 where we changed A. So our, our write operation, just like on line five, line five made the value X here to start. Line 11 did the same thing. It did a mutation of the value at that location in memory. So when I did a put char on line 13, we, we saw the updated state. When I did a put char like on line 14, like we did on line eight, which gave it the same value as before. So we see T again, the same memory address was passed along to put char erroneously. The put chair is like, yeah, what well, that looks good enough. That looks like data I can work with. So I'll just spit that out and it spits it out. Line 15, I dereference it again and then spit it out. So the correct way that we would normally mutate this is we would do the dereference and I'll call it whatever R this time around. and tell it to run, All right? And we get our output RTR, T being again from the memory address, and then R, the state of that variable in memory. All right, so a char star does not represent character data. It tracks a location of memory where character data can be. And generally speaking, it's going to be presuming it's actually a C string. So there's multiple characters of data with a null somewhere along the line. Uh, so over here, okay. <clears throat> Just going to upload that char stars. And so that, that's going to be the nature of pointers, the, the basic nature of pointers across the board. Reference type variable means it stores a memory address as its value. Doesn't matter if it's an in star, a void star, char star, a float star, a double star, a struct star, or any data type that we can create, we can create a pointer of that type so that we can track where in memory a variable of that type might exist. Char stars, aka C strings, have a lot of presumption that it's actually an array of characters. So a lot of the functionality in the library code, when it's saying, or if I come back here and do puts, where it's saying a char star, it's generally expecting that mean to mean multiple characters. And it's going to start at that memory address, spit the character out, 
increment this buffer pointer, spit out the next character, and keep doing that until it finds that that buffer pointer is referring to null. All right, so we will create some of our own code that is analogous to puts in a way that would be similar to puts. Uh, I wonder. Journal C code puts. I mean, the code's on our machine. At least the header is. Probably find the internal, or at least decompile it somewhere and see what the internals are. Of course, getting it the actual definition, but whatever. That's a little beyond what we should be toying with at this point, anyways. So yeah, please read up on pointers. There's like I had that in the drawing here. This is the key thing. Pointers store memory addresses, which means when you want to work with the data, you're going to want to dereference it. And this is why scanf needs the ampersand, because scanf wants to get to this location of memory. And the basic parameter passing rules, when you call a function, Right. Every time I call all these functions, put your, put your, put your nine times over, I'm copying the value in the variable into that function. So if what I'm copying is a value, it's a separate lifetime of that. What I'm copying is a memory address, then I'm giving it access to this letter variable. Put chart doesn't actually really do anything with that access, but I did open the door, give it access to that location of memory. All right. That's 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 two steps probably into pointers and probably have a couple more steps into the pointer pool that we'll have to go into. We'll save that for next Wednesday. So any questions? on what we have up here on the screen at the moment before we switch over and talk about the test. Send a screenshot in Discord. Okay. Do you want me to bring that? up onto the screen here. All right. One second. All right. Just getting the test one ready. Okay. Discord, screenshot in general. This one, confuse what's wrong. It's the only new one I have with it, probably it. Uh, oh yeah, it's based on our code here, so let's see. Uh, it seems your compiler is being a little bit um, more enforcing of the rules. So what was wrong was how I was using it to demonstrate it's wrong and not giving us the output that we're expecting. So it's basically saying, no, what you're doing here is wrong. So I'm not going to allow you to do it. All right, so this is just variance between compilers. So no, you're, it's, good, it's a good thing to point out because different compilers, there are, I don't know, how many versions of ANSI C are there? I wonder. Versions of ANSI C, let's see. Yeah, and I, I assume I'm not even sure what which version. Let's see. Da, da, da. Well, it's not telling me right off the bat here. 
right? So the language has gone through versions, right? C99, 1999, I think C11 is 2011. Yeah, 2011, C17, it's actually 2018. Okay, what is C2X? Ah, so I think I even have a new version coming out next year. Okay. All right, so it's up to the compiler to decide how much or how well it wants to support the standard. And different compilers will do different levels of enforcement of how they're going to support that standard. Uh, oh, I actually do have bool, underscore bool. Interesting. I'm curious. Clearly, I don't do a good job staying up to date with a the standards. They actually do have bool now. I have to look into that. All right. So they add more to the language. Basically, when one language developer adds something, the other language developer's like, yeah, I like that idea. So how can we fold that in to what we're doing? Uh, so we're probably using C17 in Visual Studio. But, uh, oh yeah, yeah, it's 2019, so yeah. We're using C19. So if you want to, and I don't know, and even then your compiler, whichever one you're using could well be using uh, C17 as well. But even then that's just establishing the language, enforcing type mapping, which is what your compiler is doing, saying the data type of C string, which is a char star does not match what put char is expecting, right? Which is expecting an integer. And even though a pointer is effectively storing an integer, it's not the same data type, which can lead to unintended behavior, which was what I was able to do with Visual Studio. Okay. Any other questions before we go over the test? All right, all right. Switch, you know, you, you should be able to do switch. Shouldn't be anything stopping you from doing switch, but the late penalty doesn't come into effect until next Wednesday. Meaning if you turn in after next Wednesday, Wednesday that you would start losing points. All right, X is, what's that, three? My, my brain's working. Sometimes I'll go fat too fast and uh, put the wrong answer in here, but I'll try not to do that. All right, prefix, postfix, different behavior. Output is X equals 15. Then output X is equal to X. We are case sensitive. We don't have to initialize. We should initialize, All right? white space between the programming pieces here doesn't matter what matters what's in the double quotes and what's in the double quotes is the same if printf will be executed seven not equal seven so it's false or equal seven is true less than equal seven is true less than seven false greater than seven is false those are equal one all right, so this is going to print all three of them because there are no breaks. And let's see, var one is six, six is greater than one. So the answer to that is two. All right, comments, that's comment, that's comment, that's comment. So only one in four. All right, same question as was on the practice. So, so we did the practice, hopefully. And several of these questions were on this practice. So hopefully you didn't miss those. Uh, bugs, right? So we're bugs. We're missing a semicolon. Having a semicolon that shouldn't be there. Missing our conditional statement. Missing a double quote. All right. So the part that you actually probably care about. 
program fragment. Let's, I don't know why it changes the default 10. Let's, Bob, whatever, int x, whatever you named it, doesn't much matter. Let's, I uh, need a number. Scan F to load up the number, whichever version of scan F you're using, secure version or the not secure version, doesn't matter. One thing is you got your ampersands, just like you were required to do in the lab. And print the number out. And it's goes it done. This one's a program. So you're supposed to have something that would compile all on its own. So your pound include. And the main method, why is it doing that? Just spontaneously changes the font on me. It main. So I just have to get in the habit of just zooming. All right. It main, and then course smiling should have a return zero. As we've been doing, if you're using void, because you already understand how that works, that's of course good. And right, we need a float. I didn't say to initialize it, so I'm just going to go explicitly on what the requirements are saying. Favorite. Prompt the user. Load that in. With that variable and then our if logic. And if f is less than zero, puts negativity. Whatever the message is, message is arbitrary. Else if, now that number five says is zero through 100. So the English interpretation of that should be inclusive. So if F is greater than equal zero, and uh, You know, I just remember we only talked about or not and up to this point. So there will be flexibility on the grading here. So I forgot that we did not explicitly talk about and. Hopefully you had read about that already, but yeah, double ampersand is and otherwise. Big, too big, I can't compute. And the text being output is pretty arbitrary. Last two questions. Oh, I forgot to change my settings <clears throat> so I could validate that. Are not auto graded, so let me pause and release the results. Right, so you can now see what you got right and wrong by looking at your quiz. I wonder if that put a student view item in there for me or not. Probably not. Yeah, okay. I'll next time I'll try to remember to do that as a student. All right, what questions about the test do we have? Uh, How many points talked off for a partial program in the last one? It's probably not much because this is the first time and I don't want the uh, structure of Canvas to get in the way of things. So it's not going to be, you know, as long as you demonstrate 
a reasonable understanding uh, for the most part. Everything should be fine, but if there are things that are glaringly wrong, then points will start being uh, lost in, in the grading. But the partial credit, if I can give you partial credit, I will give you partial credit. But if not, then I will not give it. So it depends on what it is. wrong with the code, right? We are a language class, so missing semicolons is something that is problematic. All right, so 20 out of 27 points is the max auto grade score. So if that's what you got, then you're at full credit at the moment until I manually grade the last two questions. Let's see. And I'm scrolling up, there's a bunch of questions. Let's see. Yeah, if you did a full program for the program fragment, that, that's not a big deal. That, that's not a problem. I mean, the reverse means you turn in, you're turning in more than the requirements, not a problem. Turning in less than the requirements is potentially a problem. Uh, Nathan, just message me. If you put X equals X without white space, technically that's wrong. So that's why it's grading it as wrong. But you can message me in um, Canvas. So I actually have your name because Discord, I don't necessarily have your actual name. And I can I can give you the point back for that because the purpose of x equals x is the fact that x is getting here, not really that white space that is in the printf, though that does should need to be in there. I can see by editing this question so that it's a little bit more flexible in the auto grading there. Okay. So favorite number equals zero is always good to initialize. No, you don't need the f. Uh, suffix. I would I would not mark off for not putting the suffix on the values. It's if it compiles and runs, it's we're not going to qualify it as a bug for the purposes of grading. Just because it compiles and runs doesn't necessarily mean it's not a bug because this line eight is a bug because as one of your classmates showed, some compilers are going to say no, this will not compile. Uh, says you got number five wrong. Just go ahead and send me a screenshot in um, Discord, and then we can discuss it there. And then if it's something I can give you points back for, then I'll have you message me in Canvas so I can track it back to your name. Uh, yeah, so the questions that said, what is the output of the code? The output is... Right, the string literal with x being replaced by its value. Some of the questions are what I did above here. So, like, what is the value of x? Right. So there is no output. So there's nothing to say what we printed. It's just what's the state of the variable. Did we have to use puts in the last program? Uh, problem no. Printf is perfectly capable to do everything that puts does. And then some. No, I don't care about your white space uh, in your code submission. As long as it's readable, we're good. If it's so sloppy, I have a hard time reading it, then my, my leniency tends to lean back the other way. OK, screenshots in general. I will get back to this second as I get through all the questions. Uh, so tomorrow night, while I'm playing Magic with my friends via Tabletop Simulator, I, I plan on grading and or creating bug questions. I can only do so much grading any one length of time before my brain just starts to get numb. So grading 75 tests will probably take me three hours. And 
And that probably means one hour a day over across three days. But my general objective on test grading is to try to get the test graded by the next time we meet. So Monday's a holiday. So my objective will be no later than Wednesday of next week, but I, I don't want things to build up because they build really fast in summer with all the work that is uh, coming in twice as fast because we're meeting twice as often. Uh, uh, I'm gonna try not to procrastinate as much as possible. Okay, so let's see, screenshot, put it in Discord. So I assume that means we're good to bring it up here. All right, so let's see. Yeah, so this one, yeah, no white space. Yeah, so just message me this one, number six. I put X equals X in Canvas because Tonk is not a student in my class. Bob Smith is a student, so that needs to go over there. Uh, right, I'll get to these other questions later. They don't seem to be test related at the moment. All right, back to our chat. The po point of the switch versus an F, ifs well suited to ranges and composite conditions, whereas switches are good for menus sort of things where you have a bunch of equality scenarios. It's just easier to read a switch, case A, little a, big A, case E, big E, as opposed to if letter equals little a or letter equals big A or letter equals little e or letter, there's the, the amount of syntax all right, so if you were to take the switch lab and translate the switch lab into if statements, that probably go ahead and do that. That'd probably be the best demonstration of why we have switch. The Google Drive is on the syllabus page in Canvas. It's right at the top, links with the Discord link and the actual syllabus itself. Uh, someone already answered the question, good. All right, number eight, for all languages, is that the case sensitivity? Or, uh, I think I think this is pretty much true for all languages that I'm familiar with. You know, I'm only familiar with less than a dozen, and there's probably five times that many languages out there. Most languages will have a problem if you attempt to read an uninitialized variable, however, which means you don't have to initialize it at declaration, but you need a, a logical code path that's guaranteed to execute, causing a write to that variable before we read from it because reading a variable that has indeterminate state is contrary to programming, which are supposed to be deterministic. Applications are supposed to be deterministic. If given input A, the output should be capital A. And every time you run the program, if the input is A, that same program should then output capital A. It should all of a sudden decide to say Apple instead of capital A because some sort of weird uh, rupture in the time-space continuum, continuum or something like that. Uh, let's see. I do not play Magic on Untap. Yeah, someone just started playing Magic a few weeks ago. I, you got a long time to catch up. I've been playing for about 25 years. <clears throat> Wait. No, 28 years. Yeah, been a long time. Uh, Question 16, were all the numbers printed because there was no break? Question 16, who was 16? Yes, because there was no breaks. So remember, switch is a jump and that's, it just jumps that line of code and resumes execution until it runs into another jump statement. All right, so switch is a jumping construct, just like if is a jumping construct or also known as branching, it's causing the code to generally branch one way or the other, like a tree, right? So if you're going to start at the base of a tree and you want to climb it and you decide to go up and across a particular branch, you're, that's the branch you're on. You did, you chose not to go on the, the skinnier branch because you felt it wouldn't support your weight and you chose a sturdier branch to go. But with this type of switch, it's basically you climb down to the first branch and then you use that branch to climb up to the next branch and then climb up to the branch above that instead of just going all the way down the branch. And this is one of the things that C is uncommon, I believe, 
in allowing this. And C sharp is like, no, you can't do this. You must have the jump statements. C++, of course, being like C, unless the newer versions have changed the rules, does still continue to allow that. Uh, remember I asked a question about how to get a float, interact with user input Q2. Okay, so any other question or, oh, that was for question 21. Okay, let me bring that back over here. <clears throat> Let's see. Uh, uh, yeah, well, it would just be scan F. Scan F percent F. Just like the read int lab or the read float labs we had. Right, this lab, the read float lab, or, which was just an exercise, so you didn't have to turn it in, would have been just like this. All right, so that programming question is basically this lab plus, right, this lab put together. And you'll find a lot of the tests are going to be like that. They are like the labs and exercises. Right, the, the, I, so my, my wife, uh, seeing a class and a teacher was going over how, how sometimes classes are where <clears throat> the class says, okay, yeah, uh, two plus two equals four is, is the formula. And then the program, and then the homework is two Q plus the, plus the, the square root of, of nine times negative I is the program assignment that you need to do. And then the test comes along and it's, it's the programming to the, to the factorial difficulty. Right, that that's not how I try to do things. I try to be things are on the same wavelength or same level where the the reading and the exercise in the labs lend themselves to doing the program assignments, and all of those lend themselves to to the test. Right, so I'm, I'm testing you on something that I taught you or I expected you to read from the book because I can't get, we can't get into everything in the lecture. Um, so do make sure you're reading. I didn't explicitly put any book questions in this test. And even the book questions aren't, shouldn't be entirely foreign. Or if you go look at the end of the chapter exercises and in, in self-evaluation, stuff like that, you'll see a lot of the kind of questions and, and the code that the book does are, are more or less in line with what we're doing. How to contact me on Canvas, you just, you can ping me or you can direct message at my name in one of the channels, or you can um, click my name on the side and then send me a message. Can you get credits still? Yeah, message me. If you want points back for something, you need to message me in Canvas if it's something we already talked about or something else. Uh, yeah, the white space. Yeah, white space. I don't, white space is not a big deal. Unless I'm explicitly asking a question about white space. So yeah, message me why I message me in Canvas should um, let's see. Go to your inbox. I can access over here. You should be able to just message me. I apparently I can't demonstrate that. Uh, yeah, comment down on the assignment. That, that'll probably work next since I haven't graded the, the test yet. So you go, in, go ahead and go. That works too. In fact, that's probably better. Go ahead and go into your uh, assignment. Go into the quiz. Let's see what it does. And it was due here. Probably not here, right? The results. Let's see. Can I demonstrate that here? Not here. So let's. Go to the grades. Let's see if I can do that over here. Do, 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 do. Where is test one? There's the practice. There's this one. Do, 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 do. That's a what if score. 
Yeah, I'm not 100%. How to do that? No tilde there. No, it's not, I didn't put a date on it. That's why it's not showing up where I was expecting it. Okay. Yeah, you should just be able to send me a message in Canvas from your inbox. Someone please help out your classmate on how to do that because I am not able to demonstrate. Okay. The labs. Uh, let's see. And we have do up next. And we have for loop. You define an integer variable. Have the user go ahead and give a value for that int. And then using a for loop, print hello that many times, as well as the iteration, right? So zero based, one based, whatever. Just I and hello, and then I and then hello, and then I and then hello as we iterate down the for loop. Any questions on the for loop? And last, sorry, things went a little bit longer on going with the test than I planned on. We have do while loop. Right, make two integer variables. User is going to go ahead and populate the first one. So you should add a little explanation here, asking the user for value and setting the first one to that value. And then inside the do loop, we will print the first value, ask for Another value, drop that into the second variable, and then keep looping so long as the second one is greater than the first. Let me update the do while loop. Mention. First variable. Any questions? on either of those two labs. All right, we are done for tonight. Have a safe holiday weekend. I'll see you on Discord and or Canvas between now and next time.